Uh, this is related to the fourth video about turbulent CFD at flex compute. So in the past, we discussed what turbulence looks like, then the basics of turbulence modeling with a few equations, then discussed steady turbulence modeling versus turbulence resolving simulations, which are becoming more prevalent. Uh, today, the mechanics of turbulent CFD and the big uh, parts would be a uh, pre-processing generating grids, which is uh, can be very hard, obtaining solutions and then understanding the solutions and using them for engineering. So there are two types of grids uh, going on and well, for a while. I'll start with the manual grids, which go back to the 70s probably, and then go on to adaptive. Um, so at the top, we have one of the maybe easiest uh, cases, which just a single airfoil. And uh, you can see that, uh, so this is worked by the Stratus team in Russia. Uh, they made a structured uh, C grid. You can see how they, it's a C wrapping around the airfoil. Um, and they have refinements in the regions where there's uh, rapid variations like near the leading edge, in the boundary layers, in the wake, and then they knew where the shock wave would be, so approximately, so they put in very fine grid there. So the Mach number uh, contours on the left are showing you uh, the shock, of course, the supersonic region, the boundary layers, and the wake. Um, and I noticed just this morning that the with a separation, the actually the turbulent layer ran out of the fine region of the grid. So uh, it's one of the hardest things to do is to predict the future uh, thickness of the boundary layer at different angles of attack. Now, more difficult is to grid a multi-element airfoil, and we're still in 2D. So here they used overset uh, grid blocks. You see the overset between the blue and the red here. There's interpolation back and forth between the two blocks. And then they have um, a C block here around the slab. Uh, the outside block, the blue block, is also a C uh, block. But then the block, um, the, the way the flap cuts in, inside the grid is an H grid. So the uh, grid lines don't wrap around the leading edge of the flap the way they do the leading edge of the slat or the main element. So these are very many decisions that you need to make to deal with the complex geometry. Uh, and then they have refinement. Uh, Planned in the recirculation regions behind the slat, uh, the shear layers uh, here above uh, wing, and of course the boundary layers. So this slide has adaptive grid, and these are two uh, French uh, groups that I'm working with. Um, so again, let's do a transonic airfoil. Um, so the grid is now unstructured, and it has a refinement. Uh, other shock wave here, for instance, and best refinement is an isotropic, so it's much finer in X than in Y in this case. Uh, and the adaptive uh, algorithm finds the boundary layers, it finds the mark waves, it finds the regions uh, where it's inviscid but rapidly varying. Um, and you notice, for instance, that it's uh, the viscous region is much thicker after the shock. All of this is uh, discovered by the adaptation algorithm. You get a substantial improvement in uh, accuracy and also reduction in the need for user expertise and the time the user will spend. Uh, on the other hand, there's the cost of creating a series of grids. You want to start with a very coarse grid. And this last grid is beautiful, but um, you have solved the problem about 10 times. Uh, first on a coarse grid, but still, um, adaptation is pretty complex, and some people say it's really hard to do on GPUs. Uh, the other thing is that as of now, it's limited to steady flows. Uh, if you had a simulation with uh, a buffet and the shock were moving back and forth, uh, you would have you would not be able to do this and, and so on. Uh, now for the multi-element airfoils, uh, I'm showing results from the two groups. And the second one is the same as the top. And it's a little smoother, uh, and you can see how it captured the uh, shear layer from the edge of the slat. It captured the slat wake over the airfoil, 
um, and all these things, which are things that you can see in the uh, Mach number contours. Um, so again, major improvement in accuracy and reduction and the huge uh, user load that happens that you have if you do manual grid generation. Because imagine doing this now in 3D and you have uh, supports for the slat and the flaps and so on. Okay, so grid generation, um, you're going to obtain a geometry file and it needs to be uh, watertight. So there's going to be a lot of checking and often some uh, repair or simplification. Say if you have a car and there's a gap between the door and the body of the car, you don't want to represent that uh, in the CFD, so you want to smooth over that. Uh, and so a the airplane also may come uh, with many, many parts. And if it's only a nanometer between two parts, you don't want to go put grid in that nanometer. No. So generate grids, and here I'm presuming it's manual. Um, so often you will choose grid blocks one by one. They might be moving if you are do doing a rotating uh, machinery. Uh, so unless, again, unless it's uh, automatic general adaptation, is manual. Uh, there are many rules that I will get to uh, in the last slide. Uh, and flow features such as shock waves and vortices require local refinement. And um, if you're going to do a good job to capture a vortex, it's difficult because you don't know ahead of time where exactly where it's going to be. Um, you want to run the solver. Um, now with my uh, Turbulence thinking on, the big question is whether you're going to do steady rounds, or steady rounds, or DES. And um, here are uh, pictures. Uh, and sometimes the engineer will start with the steady rounds uh, that is less accurate, but at least finds the inviscid part of the flow, and then move on to unsteady rounds, uh, which could be vortex shedding past uh, landing gear for instance, but it could be also on steady rounds because you have a rotor. Uh, and then uh, ultimately you would go all the way to a detached steady simulation, which is uh, much more accurate. Um, and uh, at the bottom, I'm showing airfoils. Uh, I think you've seen this picture already. So the steady rounds, uh, you know, it's very clean and simple uh, on the single airfoil. Uh, on the multi-element airfoil, you uh, the steady rounds is going to keep track here of the slat wake, how the slat wake merges with the boundary layer from the main element. And then they have a lot uh, going on over the flap. Sometimes you get what we call off-body separation. You have recirculation in two regions and all these things. So um, if, if you're lucky enough, you're going to get a steady uh, solution to the equations. Uh, but we're definitely, and again, this is work by Strelat, uh, moving towards doing turbulence resolving simulations. So this is same geometry, uh, but we've installed a synthetic turbulence generator. And now we are uh, resolving the three-dimensional chaotic eddies in the slat wake, in the boundary layer when they merge, in the recirculation regions and all that. Uh, this is a detached eddy simulation but there's a lot of activity in wall modeled LES, which is uh, fairly similar. Some people say wall modeled LES is going to completely take over. Uh, we'll see. Um, so you will have to get the correct flow conditions, angle of attack, and all these things. In some cases, you use continuation, use a solution at, say, 16 degrees angle of attack to go to 18, and you'll get a better convergence than if you start from a uh, uh, free stream conditions. Uh, I want you to carefully monitor the convergence of the residuals during the iterations. Um, and there is uh, an example of a residual plot. So pseudo steps, think of it as iterations. Um, you have a residual for every one of the five components of the Q vector and for the turbulence model, uh, the uh, new hat. Um, so you want this to fall to zero, which means uh, machine zero. And this is a very nice uh, convergence plot because all the residuals get to about 10 to minus 12, 
which is not far from machine zero on this computer. Uh, but you can see that the convergence uh, sometimes is irregular. You have sudden drops. Uh, sometimes it comes back up. Um, if you are doing adaptation, uh, you would partially converge and then change the grid. So the residual shoot back up and then partially converge. And finally, on your last grid, you would uh, want uh, machine zero. Um, now, if convergence is poor, many people in engineering are going to be happy with much less convergence than that. You know, five orders of magnitude, sometimes even less than that, which means that you're really not at zero, but because of problems with the grid or problem with the solution wanting to be unsteady, it just refuses to go deep enough. And sometimes people get a limit cycle and average that. This is not the right thing to do. These are not valid flow fields coming from a steady solvent. Uh, if possible, you'd continue that same simulation on that same grid as time accurate. So essentially an unsteady rounds, uh, then you would average. Uh, but often if you try to do that, the time step is so short that you can't get a real good sample. Uh, I definitely want you to explore the solution. Uh, you should look at results on different grids uh, with different turbulence models, especially if this is a new geometry or, or conditions. Uh, if you're doing the same Formula One car you've been doing for five years, uh, then you may not need to go, say, try different turbulence models. Uh, it's really good to visualize the flow, make sure something crazy didn't happen. Look at the pressure, the skin friction, the turbulence index, and all these things. Uh, don't just get the forces and moments and say, oh, the, the lift is up where I want it, so it must be that the whole simulation is good. Seeing this? Okay, so last slide. Um, so this is a manual, uh, a manual for manual grid generation for turbulent flows. Um, so you're going to distinguish the inviscid regions where the grid is relatively coarse, but still not too, too coarse. Uh, shock waves, if needed, you will want to put a lot of points there. Uh, free shear layers, especially if you have a multi-element airfoil or you have the wake of the wing and you're looking near the horizontal tail, and then vortices, uh, and then, of course, the boundary layers. So in the inviscid regions, the grid cells are fairly isotropic. You saw that in the grids before. And the density loosely follows the distance from the wall. In the free turbulent layers, uh, the best grids are nearly aligned with the streamlines. You don't want an isotropic grid. You're going to spend too much if, if you do that. But of course, this is a lot of work for the engineer. So we have guidelines for the transverse resolution, how many points you need in a, a shear layer, how many points in a wake, how many points in a vortex core. And to get great convergence, of course, these need to tend to infinity. Um, so in workshops, people talk a lot about the boundary layer uh, grid. So here their requirements are much more quantitative uh, in a way easier to give you hard numbers. Uh, so the first grid spacing in wall units, delta wall plus, needs to be less than about two for the SA model, uh, much less than one for the SST model for the same accuracy. If you were asking for, say, much better, much better than 5% on the skin friction. Um, now to get a Y plus, you need the friction velocity, uh, which you don't know ahead of time, but you know it within maybe 25%, it's not too bad. Uh, the most difficult uh, point is gonna be where the skin friction is the highest because this is what uh, makes uh, Y plus larger for the same Y. Uh, now this is, this rule is going to depend strongly on the Reynolds number because to keep delta I Y plus correct, since there's a factor of the viscosity in it, if you go up in Reynolds number and you reduce the viscosity, then delta Y divided by the size of the model is going to have to drop. And so you, you know, the, this is a rule if you're going to extrapolate to, from a Reynolds number to one uh, much larger. Uh, the stretching ratio, um, so the, the ratio of the grid spacing uh, at what, J plus one divided by the spacing at J will set the spacing in the bulk of boundary layer. And 
it's good to have this ratio roughly constant. It, it's the optimum in the log layer. As a rule of thumb, it should start less than about 1.2. And grid convergence is when this ratio turns to 1. Uh, now, this will be sustained up to uh, delta, the edge of the boundary layer. Uh, and then you can go to inverted grid spacing. But delta is actually far more difficult to estimate than you tell. I showed you earlier how, because of separation, the delta had run out of the grid that was expected. And this is it.